reference. There it is. And welcome again, I should say, now that the recording has started, to our Accelerating Climate Resilience Speaker Series event, Climate Resilience Coalitions, the role of subnational actors in preparing for climate change. As we talk through our, our Zoom etiquette, um, just wanted to remind folks that uh, you should stay on mute if you are not presenting. You can enter questions or comments in the chat. We will have MAPC staff um, managing that so that we, our facilitator, our moderator for today's event, Sasha Scheideroff, who I will turn it to in just a few moments, she will then have those questions to, to bring to our panelists toward the end of today's event, and we'll get through as many of those as we are able to. I um, did just want to note that we also reserve the right to turn the chat function off in the rare case of a disruption. We don't anticipate needing to do that, but did want to just remind folks of, of reserving our right to do so. So let's go on to the next slide and we can kick off today's event. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Cami Peterson, the Director of Clean Energy at MAPC and overseeing this Accelerating Climate Resiliency Program. We are, are very fortunate to be working in partnership with the Barr Foundation to accelerate climate resilience in the region by helping municipalities advance strategies that protect people, places, and communities from the impacts of climate change. Our intent with our grant program is to fund actionable resilience interventions that facilitate long-term innovative changes leading to greater readiness for climate change. So in particular, we really pay a special focus to elevating projects that advance climate equity, regional coordination, and social cohesion. In addition to our granting program, we also have a resiliency community of practice for our Accelerating Climate Resiliency Grant Program awardees that enables them to share skills and knowledge, discuss successes and challenges, peer-to-peer -peer and build a support network of climate resiliency champions. Then we have the speaker series as well, and this is open to the public. So we are so happy to have you all here today. Every other month or so, we bring experts and practitioners, all of you from across the country, who can speak to the ways that they are perceiving and advancing resilience. So a, a great thank you to the Bar Foundation, to their generous support, to our MEPC staff working so hard to make this event happen, particularly my colleagues Van Du, Ella Wise, Sasha Prodi, and Elise Harmon, and to those of you committing to this work in your communities every day to make them more resilient to a changing climate. So kudos and a big thank you to all of you. Today's topic is particularly close to my heart. Um, and I mentioned that our, our topic today is the role of subnational actors in preparing for climate change. Climate resilience coalitions is going to be at the heart of our discussion. And we here at MAPC have experienced firsthand the value and impact of regional climate collaboratives, particularly through our formation and facilitation of the first of its kind in the state Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition Climate Task Force which is a collection of inner core cities and towns in the Boston area. It's now 15 communities in number that are part of this coalition and this task force that are committed to working together on climate preparedness and mitigation. They first made that commitment back in 2015. They committed to being net zero as a region by 2050 and 2016. And it's been a great honor to be able to work with them and see the achievements and the, the impacts and value of coordination and, and coalition um, across, across the region. So with that, I'm very excited to turn it now now to the moderator for the day, who is also my colleague and manager of this Metro Mayor's Coalition Climate Task Force, our senior clean energy and climate planner, Sasha Scheideroff. Sasha, over to you. Great. Thanks, Cami, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, as Cami mentioned, I'm a senior clean energy and climate planner at MAPC, and um, I've had the pleasure of getting to facilitate our Metro Mayor's Climate Task Force for the past several years. Um, and through that work, I've also had the pleasure of getting to know others working across the country at the regional scale on climate change issues, both in terms of uh, climate mitigation and also preparedness, adaptation, and resilience. Um, so I'm very excited about this topic today. Um, one of the forums that we've also participated in is called the Regional Collaboratives Forum, which is this national space that brings together climate collaboratives from across the country to learn and share with each other. Um, and through that forum, as well as other conferences and projects, I've got to know all of three speakers that we have today. And I'm excited to hear, um, hear about their work and learn from them alongside you all. Um, just as a note, we do see many different models of climate 
collaborations and regional governance around climate across the country. They're doing great work, whether it's learning and sharing best practices, co-creating and co-planning together, um, setting regional commitments or doing joint advocacy at the state and federal level. And we'll be hearing about some of those examples today. Um, I do want to um, go to the next slide and introduce our first speaker. Um, so we have uh, three speakers today. We have Allison Brooks, Executive Director from the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, Lara Whiteley Binder, the Climate Preparedness Program Manager for King County, Washington, and Melanie Garate, Climate Resilience Manager from the Mystic River Watershed Association here in our region, and then um, wrapping it up with Melissa Okanya from the Climate Adaptation Coordinator and Extension Educator at UMass Amherst. Um, next slide. So uh, before I turn it over to Allison, I'll just give a brief introduction. So Allison Brooks is the Executive Director of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, a consortium of regional and state agencies in the San Francisco Bay Area focused on advancing strategies to support climate mitigation adaptation and resilience. Prior to her role, Allison also led the Livable Communities Initiative at the East Bay Community Foundation, where she founded a national model of nonprofit philanthropic and public sector partnerships called the Great Communities Collaborative to support equitable transit-oriented development across the Bay Area. Um, and I got to meet Allison a few years ago when I went out to the California Adaptation Forum and got to see and learn about all the great work happening in the Bay Area. So Allison, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sasha. And thanks so much to MAPC for hosting uh, this event. I uh, appreciate learning from other places and sharing what we're doing uh, here in the Bay Area. Next slide, please. Uh, so as Sasha uh, mentioned, um, this is a collaborative. It's actually a collaborative that I, um, that I managed that was created through state statute in California to really foster the collaboration among the regional agencies and also state agencies that have strong Bay Area regional offices. So the top four on this list, I'm not gonna read them off, um, the alphabet soup of acronyms here. Um, are written into the actual legislation. Uh, so it's regulatory agencies and our regional planning agencies were unique in that we have the Bay Conservation Development Commission, which was created over 50 years ago to manage um, development around the Bay shoreline. And then we've had volunteers that have wanted to join this collaborative effort to, to focus um, on addressing climate change, including the California State Coastal Conservancy, Caltrans, our, our state transportation, the Regional Office of our Transportation Agency and the Water Quality Control Board. Um, so uh, we work together. Uh, we, we focus on the nine county Bay Area. We have counties in California um, and the 101 cities. Uh, and you can see kind of the geography. Uh, and we are focused around the Bay, which is uh, vulnerable uh, to sea level rise and you know, a host of other hazards that we face here in the Bay Area. Next slide, please. So um, oh, I was asked to really talk about for today, um, you know, the different scales that we approach climate change. And, you know, we're in this unique space around regional government, but I'll, a lot of it is really thinking about how we optimize where we sit in the public sector to really support the implementation of, um, you know, strategies to address climate change. And so we do a lot of thinking about what happens at the different scales and how we can use the expertise we bring to move these ideas forward. So thinking about state government here in California, the role of deploying resources, setting that kind of guiding policy, providing that, that love, high level statewide guidance for a big state like California. We are a really diverse state um, and it's extremely large. So regional government here plays a, plays a bil really big role um, especially in the relationship with the state and a lot of resources come to our regional government. And we really view our role as setting these kind of action plans and guiding principles and performance metrics, developing grant programs to work with local governments and prioritizing frontline, our frontline communities and making sure they're getting the resources they need to kind of uh, address these issues. 
and providing technical assistance and guidance to support local action. You may have the same experience uh, in, in your regions that there is a lot of attention between local control and regional government, but really we're trying to foster, and I think we recognize that climate change does not uh, respect jurisdictional boundaries, that these are things we need to work on together. So a big emphasis I make all the time is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. It's essential we work across these scales and that we're, we're kind of getting the resources to local government and local act to support local action because that's really uh, where the proverbial rubber hits the road. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have some big kind of regional planning efforts going on in the Bay Area. Um, and we're really, as I mentioned, we're trying to align these across our agencies. So I have the uh, dubious task of trying to, to foster collaboration across agencies, all of which have different cultures, different kind of mission orientation. So really trying to kind of use each of these efforts to bring alignment and resources. So we just recently completed a whole regional strategy around sea level rise called Bay Adapt um, and a joint platform platform which sets up a set of actions that we're all kind of responsible for implementing. We have our regularly updated, uh, you know, sustainable community stat strategy or our, reg our um, regional plan that kind of tackles all of the issues, um, but took on sea level rise for the first time and that was just approved in the fall. And then we have other efforts around the estuary, wetland and marsh restoration, a lot of natural nature based infrastructure. So focusing in on sea level, sea level rise specifically, we're really trying to get our act together to address this and, and, and bring resources to bear to kind of support local action. Next slide, please. Um, so Bay Adapt is a regional consensus, consensus driven strategy that lays out these actions. Next slide, please. And it really touches on kind of, we've established some guiding principles, principles around this, um, which you can see here. And each of those have a set of actions around them to kind of move this forward. And I don't have enough time to go into all the details that I encourage you to go to the BARC website um, to learn more and or certainly follow up with me if you have any questions about, about this. Next slide. But you know, one of the things that we did do in the fall as well through my, my entity was establish a joint resolution across these agencies to say, we're going to work together to address climate change and we're going to align our staffing and resources to, to deliver some high priority actions over the next five years. So we're in the process of doing that, developing a shared work plan across seven agencies you can imagine is challenging, but the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna identify those, those projects that no one agency can do alone. And it's really about developing this kind of uh, system where we're supporting local action at, at, with, our, with our partners in local government. Um, so the next slide, and a lot of that, you know, depends on resources, of course. Um, and this is just a snapshot. You know, we, we do have the benefit um, of having resources to bring to bear on this. And this year, um, the, the state government has $3.7 billion that they've um, identified. And you can see a, a list of the line items within the state budget to bring just for climate resilience. So we are... Um, you know, a lot of these resources run through state agencies that go directly to our agencies. We're also trying to work with the state to bring resources directly to our agencies to, to do this work, create a whole adaptation planning program where we can get resources to local governments and support an approach to adaptation that kind of is consistent around the Bay, making sure that our frontline communities and our disadvantaged communities um, have the resources they need to be to protect themselves against the risk of, of climate change um, and, and approach it from a multi-hazard perspective. So while we're really getting our act together around sea level rise, we also are, are using this uh, process to understand how we can best influence um, strategies around wildfire. Of course, we have earthquakes, drought, um, a lot of around water management. So there's a range of issues that we're, that we're um, trying to address. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then I was asked to touch a little bit on lessons learned, and I think we can probably get into a lot of that in our in our conversations, um, in our discussion after the, we hear everybody um, share their information. But I think, you know, as I have alluded to, um, 
you know, collaboration is hard and, but setting the table and having entities like MAPC or others that can kind of, uh, or mine where we can set the table to have these discussions using data to kind of inform the conversation and, and take the politics out of it as much as we can. And, and certainly bringing all the stakeholders to the table in a way that I think we need to model new, new ways of working together valuing our community-based partners and as the local experts, as much as we do say consultant firms and others that we bring in to kind of provide that technical support, but really setting the table for um, these hard conversations around understanding the, you know, the costs and benefits of decisions that we need to make to protect ourselves and manage our risks to the different climate hazards that we face. So that's kind of where we're at now. And I'm gonna stop there. There is, uh, you know, just so much to share around this and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to keep having these types of discussions um, to learn from each other. And again, follow up with me if you have any questions after this. So thanks so much. Great, thank you, Allison. I did forget to mention at the start that we will be having an open Q&A at the end of the presentations, but that if you have questions as we go, feel free to add them into the chat um, we will try to get to as many questions as possible and hopefully have a good conversation. Um, now we're going to turn it over to um, Laura Whiteley Binder. Um, big warm welcome to Laura. Um, she is the King County Climate Preparedness Program Manager um, for the county. And in this role, Laura is responsible for working with King County agencies to prepare for the impacts of climate change and strengthening regional partnerships to address shared challenges and opportunities around climate preparedness. Prior to joining King County in 2017, Laura worked extensively with local state and tribal governments in the Northwest on climate adaptation as a senior strategist for the Un University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. Um, welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Uh, please let me know if my audio is an, is an issue. Um, I'm gonna start with the wise words of Monty Python and now for something completely different. Uh, if Allison's presentation, which is amazing uh, and the work they're doing down there is amazing. If that's the Tesla, if that's what we're aiming for, I'm gonna give you the soapbox derby vehicle where everybody's bringing a wheel, the duct tape, the cardboard, the piece of wood, and we've kind of like duct tape a car together and we're moving forward, but it is definitely, um, it is definitely a, a different vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. So the Puget Sound Climate Preparedness Collaborative is an informal network of adaptation practitioners and other, uh, other interested local government, tribal government staff who work in the Puget Sound Basin, which is shown here. We're in the kind of the, the wet side of Washington state. And we include 13 counties and have a shared geography touching on Puget Sound uh, and definitely a, we're a kind of a mountains to sound kind of area with an ecologically and economically diverse area. Next. Our collaborative started in 2017 with a number of motivations. We have a shared geography, which means we also have a shared portfolio of climate impact concerns. Uh, how those climate impacts affect any given jurisdiction, of course, it's going to be different. Uh, but broadly speaking, we have shared concerns around changes in snowpack and water supply, flooding, changing risk of wildfire, uh, changes in our marine environment, which affect uh, our, our tribes, or not our tribes, that affect Coast Salish tribes, uh, sea level rise, etc. This gives us a common framework for discussing about climate preparedness, uh, even as we explore the rich differences in how those impacts affect individual jurisdictions. We had an interest in leveraging limited resources. We wanted to reduce duplication of effort, and we wanted to facilitate, excuse me, facilitate institutional learning, particularly for our less resource jurisdictions. Next. So here's your kind of typical, uh, collection of logos, but I wanted to include this just to give you a sense of the diversity of jurisdictions that we have participating in the collaborative. We have several tribes 
and tribal organizations. We have several counties, we have local governments, we have conservation districts, we have university-based research groups, we have transit agencies, and we have our uh, several regional councils, regional planning entities. Next. So when we got started, we had grant funding that funded a part-time program manager and a range of, of programming activities. But our first effort or our first uh, focus was really on establishing a structure. So we had a steering committee with monthly steering committee calls. We created bylaws, we created a membership structure, a process for joining, a strategic plan, an annual work plan. And you know, admittedly, we spent a lot of time in the early days talking about how we were gonna do our work and uh, with you know, a little bit of a delay in getting to the work itself. Next, but we did get to that. There we go, thank you. And we were able to host a number of external facing activities starting in 2018, including three public convenings, uh, which were, I think, really valuable for bringing together different stakeholders. We had convenings around climate change impacts on stormwater, sea level rise and shoreline planning, and then climate change and the potential for wildfire in Western Washington. We had periodic webinars and we built out a website. Next slide, or next. The challenges though, as we started this, these external facing activities were that we, you know, we found that we were great at starting conversations, but it was difficult to sustain those conversations. So as we started conversations with stormwater managers over here and shoreline managers over here, and folks concerned about wildfire over there, it was a fabulous start to a discussion, but, but sustaining each of those while building on our programming became very difficult. Uh, it started to feel like random acts of engagement. We also knew that we were gonna have to find a solution for sustained funding for a program officer if we were gonna continue with the, the model that we um, had coming out of the gate. Next. So in December of 2020, uh, the, fun, the grant funding that we had ended. And in the lead up to that, we had some long conversations around what this meant for our work as a collaborative and what did we want to try to sustain. In the end, we decided that we wanted to rescale our efforts to the capacity that we had. Uh, and there was very little, partially because I think of the anxiety around COVID and what that was meaning for local government budgets. There was a lot of anxiety around what a level of funding we would be able to sustain. So if you could do, just click through. Uh, yep, thank you. So we ended up rescaling our efforts, pulling back a little bit and really refocusing on the things that participants valued in the collaborative work to date, which was primarily information sharing and the discussion that came with that, building our peer network and using the expertise, leveraging the expertise of, of collaborative members to workshop ideas and challenges to support each other's work. So we pulled back on so many external facing activities and decided to focus on maximizing the value of our monthly calls and building the, the collaborative work through those monthly calls. Priorities for 2022 are noted there on the right. Uh, it includes a variety of activities that are related to supporting comprehensive planning, and really continuing to build that organizational capacity. Next. So I have a couple of reflections that I wanted to share, really more hypothesis on this. But first, when it, I have this, I, I have, the, and I just want to caveat that these are reflections based on my experience to date. Uh, and I'm not speaking for the collaborative in this part. First, when you look at regional collaborative action, I think you'll find a lot of early successes around work on mitigation. And I, my hypothesis for that is that it's easier to build a common framework for joint action uh, around mitigation than adaptation. Next. And by that, I mean, if we look at in King County, we have the King County Cities Climate Collaboration. This is a greenhouse gas emissions wedge. This is a collaboration of 17 jurisdictions. They have a shared greenhouse gas emission target. They've done greenhouse gas inventory collectively. They have the wedge that shows where they need to make reductions to meet their target. This has given a framework for action that has made it, I think, very easy, although I'm not saying that mitigation work is easy, but it's made it easier for those communities to come together as a collaboration 
and to work collectively on changing policies that and, and other uh, requirements that are necessary to meet these greenhouse gas emissions redu reduction targets. So my hypothesis here is that when it comes to work, collaborative work on mitigation, it's easier to identify and measure a shared target. It's easier to identify and measure shared pathways for reaching that target. And the action specifics, things like energy codes, regional transit, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, there's, they're more transferable across jurisdictions. Uh, and, yeah, and then there's the fact that we've, we have been at this work longer. I think people are more familiar. Again, I don't wanna say that it's easy, but I think people are more conversant on what needs to be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next. The other hypothesis I have here is that working at scale is vital and rewarding, but you, there are trade-offs when you move up in scale. And it's really important that you find the scale that fits with your goals. If you could go ahead and click through. So these are the three different scales that I wanted to draw attention to. The first on the left is King County. I mentioned earlier the King County hyphen cities climate collaboration, which is focused on greenhouse gas emissions reduction work. There are 17 jurisdictions within one county. There's a common governance structure, shared laws, shared building codes, et cetera, that, that make that collaborative work, I think, uh, very, doable and allows them to get into the level of detail that I think is, is actually needed to really change policies and to get work moving forward to make those changes on the ground. That next figure of Washington, that's a four county region. That was actually the original vision for the Puget Sound Climate Preparedness Collaborative. It was originally gonna focus on a four county area that has a common regional governance um, or regional planning agency, the Puget Sound Regional Council. That was a scale that we were initially envisioning working at, but we did ultimately move up to 13 counties. Thank you, Sasha. And as we moved up in scale, it changed the nature of our work. It, there are similarities and shared needs, but as we moved up in scale, I think it did make it harder to get into the details that really comes with, you know, as Alice mentioned earlier, the rubber hitting the road. And in our case, we found that because of our scale and our resource limitations, it was really easier and better, more appropriate for us to focus on building organizational capacity, looking at how we do work and sharing examples rather than trying to get into the specifics of policy change. Next. Next slide. Thanks. So in terms of my closing thoughts, I do want to emphasize that I think regional collaboratives serve a really important role uh, that for building a community practice, leveraging local expertise, supporting less resource partners, and developing shared practices. And it's been a really rewarding experience working together as a collaborative. I think the scale, there are trade-offs in this scale that need to be considered. And I would recommend that in working in a collaborative and a regional scale, Think about what are your goals, what's the kind of work that you want to do as a collaborative, and find the scale that fits so that uh, fits that um, fits those goals. And then I'll note, you know, we have no resources. We literally have zero budget. We're doing this all on our own time. Uh, we're able to do this. Um, and it's been great, and we're having some really good, rich discussions, and we're moving the work forward, but some resources would be nice. I can't lie about that, but uh, you can do this even when you don't have the resources. But it, so with that, I'll, I'll say thank you. Great, thanks, Laura, that, that was great. Um, there was a comment in the sidebar of that it doesn't actually seem like a soapbox derby car. So <laughs> do, doing a lot of great work um, out there. It's great to, that last visual you had um, of the different scales really kind of pulls all of that together. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Melanie. Melanie Garate is the Climate Resilience Manager for the Mystic River Watershed Association, Myra, in the Boston area. And at Myra, she works with municipal staff, community-based organizations, public health officials, and local residents to incre increase climate resilience regionally. Um, with community equity and health as a priority, she focuses on enhancing climate solutions within the watershed via nature-based solutions and social change. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to welcome her here today to talk about some of the work that she's doing through Myra and through the Resilient Mystic Collaborative. 
Thanks so much for that warm welcome, Sasha, and excited uh, to be on a panel with such accomplished uh, women in climate resilience leaders. Next slide, please. So just as a little bit of a backdrop for anyone who is not from around the area, the Mystic River watershed uh, is uh, encompasses 76 square miles. So that's just about the size of Brooklyn, New York or Amsterdam in Holland and houses over half a million people. And most of those folks are in the lower part of our watershed, which is predominantly our urban core and our environmental justice work. Um, and next slide. And our watershed association is your typical watershed association that protects water, habitat, uh, transforms parks, um, and connects people to the water. But we also have, uh, in the past three years, started our climate resilience program. And why climate resilience at a watershed association might be one of your questions. And if next slide, please. Um, and this is so that we can help communities adapt and prepare for the worst impacts of climate at a regional scale. And so that can be things such as adaptation uh, on the smaller scale, looking at uh, stormwater drains um, and rain gardens at a little bit of larger scale, building uh, larger parks to lower the urban heat island effect. And then it can also be um, around emergency preparedness around flooding, such as uh, temporary uh, floodgates um, shown on the right. And so um, at, at the watershed scale, we're especially able to focus on flooding. So as several of the presenters um, have mentioned in, um, previously, climate change knows no boundaries. And as we're thinking about flooding in particular, if we're thinking about the watershed scale, um, lots of municip municipalities have similar flooding um, flooding areas and floodplains. Next slide, please. If we think about the climate resilience sector today, we're mostly thinking about protecting two things, uh, the environment. So how can we maintain the ecological resilience of uh, let's say salt marshes to protect our coasts? And then we're also thinking about property. How do we protect um, property such as buildings and homes um, that house uh, people and things? But often we don't actually center in on the core of what we're trying to protect, which is next um, people. And so with the uh, Resilient Mystic Collaborative um, at the Mystic River Watershed Association next, we wanna make sure that everything here is connected and that people are also centered. And so that, uh, next please, we're thinking about the environment, people and property uh, together to make sure we protect all three. Next slide, please. Um, so we hope to uh, build climate resilience for people and place, next slide. And to that, uh, we have created uh, and founded the Resilient Mystic Collaborative, which uh, puts together 21 communities uh, and partner on climate challenges that no single municipality can solve alone. Uh, we are data-driven and action-oriented and making sure to be pragmatic and optimistic in the types of solutions that we build, as well as being mutually supportive of each other. Next slide. And so um, we have uh, 20 out of the 21 municipalities partnering within the Resilient Mystic Collaborative. Our structure is that there is at least one municipal leader um, at the table during our quarterly steering committee meetings. And so these are municipal staff and leaders um, that are hiring such as the uh, lead uh, engineer of Cambridge or um, the sustainability officer um, or the urban planner of Chelsea, for example. And so that way we have decision makers at the table who can really move the dial um, on regional climate resilience. Next slide. And so um, we are uh, uh, for 
we, we have four working groups. And so we do not just get together to learn about what each other is doing, but we actually set to do work uh, together. And so we have four working groups, such as um, the social resilience working group that is making sure to um, prepare people for the worst um, impacts of extreme weather. We also have the lower mystic working group um, working to storm proof critical infrastructure. So mo the majority of the critical infrastructure in our region is in the lower part of our mystic, that being um, our Logan airport, um, uh, really critical dams, oil terminals, um, all of the, the harbor tunnels and uh, the, the metro stations that are in the area. And we also have an upper mystic working group um, that is attempting to manage regional flooding and how can, um, if we manage flooding at the upper part of our mystic, how can that actually help to protect not only the upper mystic communities, but the lower mystic communities as well. And last but not least, we um, have an advocacy and outreach working group to manage state funding and policy um, that is also uh, working together to um, manage all of this big uh, federal funding that is coming our way in the last couple of months. Um, so I'll just finish off with, um, next slide please, sharing uh, really, really quickly a couple of projects that wouldn't have come together if we hadn't also focused on people uh, and having equity and justice in mind. So one of them is the lower mystic vulnerability assessment. So we did um, a very typical type of infrastructure vulnerability assessment during an extreme storm um, or uh, uh, doing a, a scenario of an extreme storm, such as a Hurricane Sandy, um, if that were to come through the Boston area. But we also did at the same time a social vulnerability assessment and then set up our priority items and next steps uh, to focus on not only if people um, or not only if we can protect infrastructure, but how can we prioritize that based on who is most vulnerable in that region? Next slide. And then we also are making sure to manage extreme heat. And so extreme heat is not something that we have planned for in the past uh, in the Boston area. And just this, uh, this year and last year, we have started to uh, focus in on where our urban heat islands are. And to that end, we have a, a regional project to map our urban heat islands via volunteer science to make sure to involve uh, the community and then help to build solutions with them. So with that, I'll pass it back over uh, to Sasha and excited to hear all of your questions. Great, thanks Melanie. And thank you to our other panelists. Um, let's see, I do have a question to start off the bat. So, Lara mentioned that there um, were sort of trade-offs working at different scales within um, regional collaboratives. And I think across the three examples um, that you all shared today, there's, there's different scales, different number of agencies, communities, um, all of that. And so I'm just curious, um, Melanie and Allison, what would you say are some of the trade-offs um, and benefits for working at the scale that you do? Well, we have to work at every scale. So somebody has to work at the regional scale. Um, <laughs> I think what, uh, I mean, I think it's all about um, really zeroing in on what the appropriate roles are. And, and uh, again, which I, I mentioned, um, of course, having the resources to do the work is, is really, really important. But, you know, thinking, you know, the regional scale is valuable. We have to think at that scale, uh, especially with climate change on, on kind of understanding the ecology of the place, kind of how all of these things are working together. So how we're using it to help people at the really local level kind of move back and understand as a region how we're prioritizing resources how we're making sure that technical support and assistance is going to the places that maybe aren't, um, you know, don't aren't at the level of capacity that they need to be. Um, so it's really th that that um, that level of that that's so essential to ultimately, if we're thinking about outcomes, that's that's ultimately about um, helping people reduce their risk. 
then it's about getting the resources and the support to them that they need. And I think that it, it all needs to be focused. If we think about how we're operating at these different scales to deliver outcomes um, and, and, and getting the resources where they're needed, I, I think it's just, that's a helpful perspective for, that I bring to it for myself. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, and to add to that, I think in terms of trade-offs, uh, you know, working regionally can be hard because there's simply a lot of stakeholders. And when you have a lot of really smart people in the room, you know, we can start to point in different directions and not get to a central point. Uh, and so to that end, it's really important to have a very strong facilitator um, who's able to build consensus among your group. And so um, it definitely is important to hire someone who has those skills uh, to manage uh, larger groups of, of very uh, smart uh, and knowledgeable people and in order to really prioritize what is good regionally uh, for your area. Uh, and then in terms of really positive, um, uh, you know, sides of having a regional area is that some communities are simply um, you know, well, res better resource than others. And so when you have uh, one or two really well off um, communities, let's say in our area, um, Boston and Cambridge, we can help and build more resilience in other areas, such as in our area, um, Chelsea or Everett, that really don't have the staff capacity um, to uh, uh, handle those challenges. And so you know, we were focused on creating a united front in those areas. And um, luckily we've been able to um, obtain lots of funding to help both um, lower resource municipalities and higher resource municipalities. Sasha, can I add something? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, you know, as, as an organization, like, well, you notice I said early that we are an informal network and we initially started out trying, with the goal of being a more formal network and then decided to scale that back. But one of the things that we are doing to try to direct resources is we are really trying to kind of use a, a we're trying to position ourselves as a resource to the state agency. So Washington State for the first time is going to have state resources to direct towards preparedness. Uh, as a result of legislation that was passed last year. So this is kind of a new ground for us to figure out how do we as this network of adaptation practitioners and communities who are at various stages of adaptation planning, how do we communicate back to the state agencies where we think uh, resources would be helpful and what are the issues that we are wrestling with as we try to implement adaptation actions within our communities. And so one of the, I think, one of the, the powerful ways that collaboratives can, can work together is by using that voice to, to speak to the state agencies, even when we don't have like a charter and we don't have our own resources to direct to the work. It can be really, really helpful for state agencies to know that there's this collaborative over here. There's this resource to tap into when they're looking for feedback. And there's a way for us to speak with a voice back up to our elected officials and state agencies about our needs. But just, just stepping like, it, taking that even further, you know, like if we just, you know, I think it's a tricky um, situation we're facing because if we just allow cities to just go it alone and developing, all, you know, doing their own kind of interventions or strategies, and as we've alluded to, climate change doesn't care about uh, jurisdic you know, jurisdictional boundaries. What we have, like, let's just take sea level rise, for example, we have one jurisdiction that's going to build a big, big seawall and we have another that's right next to it that's going to experience kind of that, the situation that could occur with the water kind of flowing in different, different ways and, and having undue impacts on other surrounding neighborhoods or communities. So I think there has to be a regional kind of coordinating role around decision making um, making sure that there are, are frontline, low-income frontline communities are receiving the resources they need because we're only, you know, as as strong as our weakest link, if you will. So I, I just think there has to be a regional role to address address these issues. Um, so it's just, you know, but how we're kind of um, being clear about the roles and responsibilities is a really important part of this. Yeah, it's interesting that that you say that um, here in Massachusetts, we don't 
really have a strong county government like you do both in California and in Washington. And so um, there is a very strong sort of local control, home, home rule control around sort of what's happening in municipal boundaries. And um, Melanie, I've talked about uh, the need for new governance structures to, to deal with the issue of climate and that our current um, sort of municipal governance doesn't necessarily get at all of those challenges. Um, but I imagine that even with stronger counties and some of this regional work that it's still challenging to do that. Well, I think if you organ, I think one way to approach it is organizing um, by ecology. I mean, depending on what hazard, which you've alluded to, you have mayors that are organizing themselves around a, a watershed, which is, the, I think, the right approach. So kind of approaching it from what are the issues that we're trying to manage here and then organizing governments around that way. I think counties are helpful here because we have counties that have, say, you know, like San Mateo County, which is our most vulnerable county in the Bay Area, has 20 really small jurisdictions relative to other areas of the Bay that just need, you know, that's the other thing. Small jurisdictions just don't have the resources to kind of tackle a lot of these. It, they have like one staff person that's responsible for so many, so many things. Um, so they need support. I think what we're finding is that actually cities are clamoring. They don't want us to tell them to build housing, but they're certainly clamoring for some support um, around managing their risks. So I think that's an opening right there um, for regional government um, to, to have a big role and an important role to play. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Great, so I have a question from Ariella Lovett from um, the Municipal, uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association, MMA. She asks, what works well and what could be improved in your working relationship with municipal officials and employees? She's asking from that perspective. So what have you found that's worked well um, in working with uh, both officials, but also I think municipal staff? Anyone can jump in, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think what has worked well uh, within our collaborative is that uh, these folks really um, have the power to, let's say, apply for state funding or uh, know their region really well and are able to uh, work with others um, in a collaborative way that has been really beneficial. Um, I think what what we have identified, um, especially during uh, the you know racial awake awakening last year, is that we we are still coming from a structurally uh, racist entity uh, in the area, and so in many ways we have uh, replicated that within um, the Resilient Mystic Collaborative and other ways. Um, and so, uh, in order to tackle that um, you know we have to be able to hear from different voices and then also change our hiring practices in the future um, and uh, per perhaps even potentially um, change the structure of the collaborative in general um, so that we have diver diverse voices in the room that can center on on equity and justice in the area so that our most vulnerable um, and priority populations can also see a big win. Um, and not get pushed out, for example, if we decide, all right, well, this is, this neighborhood is the hottest. Um, how can we work with that um, municipality to make sure that um, they have more access to green space or they have more trees or their housing is improved or their public services are improved um, for the summer, but then also that those neighborhoods or the people in those neighborhoods don't get displaced. Um, uh, through green gentrification or climate gentrification and things like that. Um, so, you know, we're working within um, the structure of, of our society and, and figuring out ways to disrupt that is one of our main goals and, and challenges. Thanks for sharing. I would, I mean, I think the way that we improve our relationship is value, having value added. So basically bringing resources to local jurisdictions um, and, providing, you know, down to 
as I you know mentioned, like you have one staff person in a small jurisdiction that is doing a million different things. So how do you make their life easier? If we if we want to have like policies passed across jurisdictions, and we want some consistency and quality and and some way of like making sure that resources are being utilized to help us meet our regional goals, then we need to kind of provide as much um, support down to like writing a, a, providing a template for a city council kind of um, memo or kind of walking them through all the steps to kind of get to an ordinance or some kind of policy or, you know, a, a process. Um, you know, I think even think as regional agencies, we could provide project managers to jurisdictions to help them um, do adaptation planning. So I think it's just understanding from jurisdictions what they need um, if we're all kind of moving towards the same outcomes and getting back to this, what is what are agencies best suited to do to pro to move us towards delivering actual outcomes, you know, and, and how can we support local municipal governments to achieve those goals. Great. Laura, did you want to say something? I will. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It says I'm muted, but um, yeah, absolutely. I think at the technical staff level, these opportunities to get together and peer to peer network share, uh, you know, share the case studies, workshop ideas, you know, we've, we've had uh, collaborative monthly calls where one partners come in and essentially kind of tested some capital planning guidance, right? Does this make sense? How, how does this, you know, what's missing, etc. Um, being able to essentially use that collective expertise to help support each other's work and move it forward. Um, the King County Climate Cities Collaboration, which has been focused on mitigation, has had really good success working with elected officials through twice yearly elected officials workshops where they bring workshop or those elected officials together to talk about the shared priorities around greenhouse gas mitigation. And as I look at that, we've talked about how do we do something like that at the scale of the Puget Sound Climate Preparedness Collaborative. And part of this is identifying what is the ask of elected officials. And these are the conversa conversations we're working towards and bringing those folks together. But I think bringing electric, uh, elected officials together for that chance to have their own peer-to-peer -peer and to have these conversations specifically around preparedness is a really important way to get them to have some ownership of the conversation and of the work. Um, and I think it's just a matter of figuring out what is the right ask in bringing them together, knowing what their time constraints are. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, so unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the discussion, but I feel like I could keep talking to you all, all afternoon um, <laughs> about the um, benefits and challenges of working at the regional scale. Um, we did want to turn it over to uh, Melissa Okanya from the um, UMass Extension. She's the Climate Adaptation Coordinator. Um, and we want her to share a little bit about the resources that she and her um, organization can provide to those in Massachusetts. Um, so Melissa, do you wanna share a little bit about what you, what you do? Sure, thanks, Sasha. It's been really wonderful to hear from all the speakers today, and I feel like they really illustrated how collaboration is vital to successful climate resilience and adaptation, um, and that these collaboratives and networks provide much needed space for peer-to-peer -peer learning and building on each other's work, um, which all feels really essential if we're going to have any hope of responding and transforming quickly enough to climate change. Um, so I've been asked to close this out by sharing a couple additional opportunities and resources to engage with climate adaptation networks in particular. Um, and so first off, for those who are in Massachusetts and working on climate adaptation, particularly those interested in natural resources, uh, I coordinate a community of practice called MassyCAN, the Massachusetts Ecosystem Climate Adaptation Network. Uh, and MassyCAN builds community in many ways, including our monthly newsletter and our events. Um, we've put the join link in the chat and please do consider signing up if you haven't already. It's just a really easy way to stay up to date on climate adaptation in our state. Um, through Massey Can, we also convene an expert work group specifically for watershed scale climate collaboratives. Um, and so for folks who are interested in regional and watershed scales, 
we actually have a suggested reading list, um, which is now in the chat, thanks. Um, and we actually also just put out a new publication, a one pager overview on watershed scale climate collaboration. Um, this piece is the first in a toolkit that we're developing with our um, fellow Massachusetts collaboratives over the next year. And this will share the importance of the scale of the work and try to get more supporters engaged. Um, and this is thanks to funding from the Bar Foundation. So that's also in the chat, great. Um, and then for those who are organizing already around um, you know, leading a climate collaborative or a coalition, you're also very welcome to join the ASAP affiliated Network of Networks group. Um, so I coordinate that specifically for climate network leaders and organizers across the country. Um, and we have monthly calls and we share resources to advance our common work. Um, and then if you're interested in some additional bedtime reading, that Network of Networks group collaborated on a recent resource called Promoting Peer-to-Peer -Peer Learning for Climate Adaptation. Uh, and this includes examples from various collaborations in the Northeast in particular. Um, so that was very quick, but just to say, please feel free to reach out about any of these. Um, and thank you for all you're doing to, to promote collaboration. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, and I just want to close out by saying thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, we appreciate you spending the time to, to talk with us um, and to join us today. And to thank you to our audience um, and your engaging questions. Um, and to Ella and Van for organizing the event. And to please look out for our next speaker series, which will be in the new year. And I hope you have a happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye.